Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 140. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger, and I'm so glad that you could join me. As always, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and thanking the wonderful listeners who continue to support this podcast via Podbean Patron, and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and tune into every episode, perhaps you'd consider becoming a Talking Tudors patron. Just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family, and in addition to receiving lots of Tudor themed goodies, you'll be automatically entered into our patron only monthly giveaways. December's prize is a Tudor Rose Collection candle package sponsored by Clio Global. Clio's Tudor Rose candle recreates the aromas of the Tudor court. This month's Talking Tudors patron prize will feature a Tudor Rose candle along with art prints of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, created by Clio partner Royalty Now. All patrons are also eligible to attend monthly Talking Tudors live talks, which take place on Zoom. These events are exclusive to patrons. On the 29th slash 30th of December, depending where you are in the world, I'll be chatting to Tracy Borman about her new book, Crown and Scepter, and much more. Please get in touch with me if you'd like to register for this event. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. I'd love to see pics of you wearing or using your Talking Tudors merch, so please do tag me on social media and use the hashtag #ILoveTalkingTudors. I'd also like to take this opportunity to share that I'll be taking part in two virtual conferences in February and early March. Dr. Owen Emerson and I will be giving a joint presentation at the Writers' Convention 2022, hosted by the History Quill. This five-day virtual convention for historical fiction writers or budding historical fiction writers will run from the 2nd to the 6th of February 2022 and will take place on Zoom. There will be multiple events held on each day, and the great thing is that you can attend all five days or only one or two, depending on what your interests are. Our presentation, entitled The Real Tudors, is on day five, the 6th of February. I'm also thrilled to share that I'll be taking part in an upcoming online conference about Anne Boleyn, hosted by Claire Ridgeway. It will consist of eight Berlin experts, seven days of online talks and exclusive live Q&A sessions. On day four, the 3rd of March, Sarah Morris and I will be giving a talk entitled In the Footsteps of the Early Years of Anne Boleyn. For more information on these events, please visit my website www.onthetudortrail.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled that joining me on the show to talk about Shaw House in Berkshire is Sarah Somerville. Sarah has worked in historic houses and places of heritage for over 10 years. Her career began at Highclere Castle, also known as Downton Abbey, whilst completing a degree in museum and gallery studies. Starting as a tour guide, Sarah later joined the events team and remained at the castle for over seven years. In 2019, Sarah began her role at Shaw House, an Elizabethan manor house in Berkshire. Since then, she has written the first guidebook for the house, as well as reintroducing an archive and conducting guided tours. She also runs events at Shaw, which take place throughout the year. 
Our conversation's coming up straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tutors, Sarah. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And let's just begin by you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so my name is Sarah Somerville. I've worked at historic houses and places of heritage for over 10 years now. Um, I've always been interested in art and history, so that combined led me to study museum and gallery studies at university. But just before I started, I, I began my career as a tour guide at Highclere Castle, uh, which many people will actually know as Downton Abbey. Um, so I, I was then there for just over seven years. I started working in the public opening and events department, carried on guiding as well. But I've also volunteered in a number of different museums and National Trust properties and started working at Shaw House in 2019. And I've always said, when people ask me about my job roles and volunteering roles, I always say, you spend so much time at work, <laughs> you might as well spend it in some really nice, historical, pretty places. <laughs> Absolutely, lucky you. So we are going to chat a little bit more about Shaw House today. So d- could you tell us a little bit about the history of the house? So Shaw House was built in 1581 for a wealthy cloth merchant, Thomas Dolman. It's very much an Elizabethan manor house. It's known as a prodigy house. And by that, I mean, it was built with ambition in mind. It was built to show off newfound wealth and status. Tudor life would have been really typical of the time at Shaw House. You would have had the the large, tall central hall, bedrooms with large four poster beds, a a huge kitchen with an even bigger fireplace to cook all the meat in and there would have been a lot of staff so a lot of servants for the family a lot of servants within the house but also a lot of grounds workers and gardeners to tend to the vast estate deer parks and also the uh, the delicate Tudor gardens there would have been fountains and delicate planting all of that going on so it would have been very typical of Tudor time But as I say, it was built with ambition in mind. They hoped for a visit from royalty and Elizabeth I did visit in 1592 on one of her royal progresses. And at that time, the house was only 11 years old and it would have been such an impressive sight um, as it remains today, of course. But since then, a lot has happened to the house. It's survived civil war battles. Um, It also welcomed a lot more royalty. Every member of the, the Stuart family came, came here to visit. Uh, so a lot has happened and a lot's gone on within the house and around the grounds as well. It's said that King Charles I was narrowly missed by a musket ball in one of the rooms during a, a battle of the Civil War. But mainly Shaw House remained a family home. It was passed through different families and different generations for 364 years. So It was very much a family home for quite a long time. But in the Second World War, that's when things dramatically changed for the house because it was requisitioned by the war office. So it was used by them um, to station soldiers here. But also during the war, a local council school was bombed, sadly, and teaching needed to continue somewhere. And they decided, let's try Shaw House. And so they transformed a lot of the rooms here into classrooms. And eventually it was then sold to the council for its continued use as a school. It's still owned by the council today. The school continued, although it was only a temporary measure to begin with, it actually was a school for about 40 years. So the temporary measure went on a bit longer than anticipated. 
but many local people, of course, know Shaw as Shaw House School, and they come back and, and remember their classes being here. But eventually, in the 80s, it was decided that the structure was too unsafe to use as a school. So they actually closed this building and continued teaching in buildings nearby, eventually moving to the building that they continue to teach in next door now. Um, and the house really stood empty for about 16, 17 years um, until luckily the funding was found to restore it and bring it back to its former glory. So that was with help from the Heritage Lottery Fund, English Heritage, Vodafone, and of course the council as well. So all that money went into restoring the house, but also the decision was made that it would have to earn its keep. It couldn't just sit and be pretty. It needed to earn its money. So subtle changes were made, even down to more electrical points so that we could have meetings and conferences here and run it as a business. Um, but it's still very much a heritage venue as well. We have open days, uh, public opening events, all of that sort of thing. So there's a lot going on and a lot of history to share. <laughs> I always say when I do talks and when I was writing the guidebook, there's so much history, 400 years worth of history to try and fit into quite a short space of time is quite a challenge. Absolutely. So Sarah, just for the benefit of people that maybe haven't heard about it before or aren't too familiar with England itself, where were you situated? So Shaw House stands just north of the town of Newbury, which is in Berkshire. So um, sort of midway between London and Bath, if you think of it along the, the south. So it's an ideal location for people who are having meetings as a, a meeting point, um, a middle point between those two locations. But we're really easy to get to. And, and also, I mean, our location has been why the history has been so vivid through the years, especially within the, the Civil War period, because this location was so important. So, yes, Berkshire is, is where we are. Wonderful. And it's really exciting to hear that Elizabeth I visited as well. Do we Are there many details about the visit or is it just sort of known that she, she dropped in and that's about it? it? It's pretty much the latter, unfortunately. There's so many things that I'm still working on to try and dig deeper into the history and um, the archives when restoration happened the archives were sort of a bit split up and went to different places so I'm slowly rebuilding that um, but so that's an area of history that I really want to know more about but we, we know that she was here and she was entertained nearby at Donington Castle which is another great uh, place to go and, and have a walk around if you're you're visiting nearby so we know very little but it's work in progress. <laughs> but watch this space. Excellent. I like it. So exactly. in terms of the architecture of the house, does much of the Elizabethan fabric actually survive or have there been a lot of changes over the centuries? So externally, absolutely. Externally, when you come up the drive, you're met with an Elizabethan manor house. There's no mistaking it. You've got the recognisable um, symmetry of the building. So Shaw House is actually a H shape. You, you've got all those notable features of a prodigy house. So a new material brick was mainly being used for palaces, but it was used for Shaw House. Uh, the glass, there's so many windows. They were showing off that they had all this money to buy glass with because glass was very expensive and even down to the number of chimneys that Shaw House shows shows off wealth because fireplaces were reserved for those who could afford them so the amount of chimneys is really showing off look how wealthy we are so in terms of the exterior really not much has been changed and anything that has changed has been done very sympathetically to the original build so for example a couple of windows have been lowered um, but in keeping with the original design. If you think about Shaw House as that H shape that I mentioned, the bar in the middle was actually extended as well. It was made wider to allow for a loggia or a corridor to be introduced inside. So on the exterior on the north side, that sort of middle part is fairly new, if you like. It was in the, the 1850s, so not too new, but newer than its, its original date uh, that it was built. But again, it was done sympathetically. So if you're looking from the outside, you really wouldn't know unless it's pointed out to you. But as you come inside, that particular change, interestingly, is very evident because you've still got the exterior or the original exterior brickwork on the inside of that, that corridor. So although you're inside the house, you've got the exposed brickwork and you've even still got some of the windows 
with the original Elizabethan glass in as well, which are beautiful features, but often we get the question of why is there a window like that inside? It's a bit bizarre. But but yeah, so the, the external features of the house are very recognisable as Elizabethan and haven't been amended too much. But as you come in, as with any family home, over time, fashions of interior design develop and they change. And that's what's happened at Shaw. We do still have some of the Elizabethan or the Tudor panelling on the walls. Um, but again, that's been moved and, and changed to different rooms. Um, but a lot of the panelling was covered with Georgian panelling over time. And for example, the tall hall that I mentioned um, that's central to the house, that was reduced in height to allow for a suite of rooms to be introduced in um, the very early 1700s for a visit from Queen Anne. So through the years, the architecture within the house has been developed, but it's also allowed us to retell the history in a very visual way, you know, showing off that, that suite of rooms as a time when, when royalty was here. But interestingly, the panels that were added later, the Georgian panels, they were sort of plonked on top of the Tudor panels, if you like, and the Tudor fabric of the building. So when they came to restore the property, they took each panel off the walls, numbered them, restored them and replaced them to their original place. And when they were doing so, they rediscovered a lot of the Elizabethan fabric of the building. So they found uh, doorways that had witch marks on. They found Elizabethan windows, huge, gorgeous brick fireplaces. So much was rediscovered that they decided upon returning the panels to put a few of them actually on hinges so that we can actually open up those later additions and reveal what's hidden beneath. And we, we name them reveals. And during public opening, we'll open those up. And it is lovely seeing people's faces. You know, they come in and they see, obviously, the beautiful Georgian panelling. But then when we open it up and I explain about the witch mark on one of the, the doorways, it's just lovely to see people's reaction to that. Yes, and I've seen pictures of that. It's very, very exciting. I love how how layered these houses are, you know, all the different layers of story, I suppose, and the people that have lived there. It makes them so, so interesting. See that, and it really helps tell the story in a very visual way. I'm quite a visual learner, so I enjoy that you can see all these changes quite clearly. But perhaps one of the most intriguing discoveries during restoration, which restoration took place in the early 2000s, was an Elizabethan bakehouse that they thought was completely lost. And it's a unique bakehouse because usually with bakehouses, they'd be situated away from the main house because of the, the risk of fire. This one is located directly beneath the kitchen, which is in the west wing of the house. It's directly underneath the house. But it was used in Elizabethan times for pastries, for bread, for, for baking a lot, I mean, daily for the family. And in later years, the Duke of Shandos, when he, he lived here, he was the, the Georgian gentleman that lived here, he filled the bakehouse in and didn't use it. So it was sort of forgotten about. It wasn't in later inventories. It wasn't noted about at all since that time. So it was sort, sort of thought that it was completely lost. But when they dug it out during restoration, they found the beehive um, style bread oven still there. There's the, the shelving for it. There's evidence of a staircase. There's the windows. It's it was completely preserved, really. Amazing. And so that's spectacular. And we do we have opened that for visitors once, um, but it's very tricky to get to. You have to go through a sort of a trap door in the floor <laughs> of the cafe down this sort of loft ladder style um, entry. So it's quite difficult to get to, but we are we are opening it for special events and, and things like that because it's it's just so interesting for people to see. It's amazing. I think it's those kind of everyday sort of features that bring houses to life and you can really kind of connect with the people that were living there. So that's that's really wonderful. And you mentioned that you do have open days. Uh, so apart from the, the couple of things you've mentioned, what can visitors expect to see on a, on a day's visit to Shaw House? Well, firstly, you can see the reveals. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. So... Uh, most of the rooms will be open. As I, I think I briefly mentioned, the operation of Shaw House now outside of term time is that we, we open as a heritage venue, but within term time, so Monday to Friday through a lot of the year, 
we are a meetings and conference centre. So we have delegates using the, the rooms for, for training. We're still owned by the council. So a lot of that is council training. Um, so during an open day, sometimes there'll be a couple of rooms that are booked out, but mostly most of the rooms are open. We, we save that for public opening. Uh, so you'll see a lot of the rooms and within those rooms, You've got the reveals, so you, you're seeing the Georgian architecture, you're seeing the, the Tudor fabric of the building. Unlike many historic homes, National Trust, English Heritage Properties, through the years, through its changed use, a lot of the historical furniture and the decorations, so paintings, have been sold. I, I mentioned that it was bought by the council, that was in the 40s. So at that time, a lot of the furniture and historical aspect of Shaw was lost. And of course, it was changed into a school. So there was classroom furniture, it, it had a very different use. So although you've got the historical aspect, the, the historical furniture and the paintings aren't here as perhaps you would expect. But what that does mean is that we can allow the architecture to do the talking and these reveals, we wouldn't have them if there was all this furniture within the room. So it's a unique experience in that way. And it, it really allows the room to do the talking when you walk in. And I also think it's useful because often when you visit places, they'll be set in a certain way or in a certain period, whereas here, if you've got that imagination going, you can really imagine this room used in Tudor times or in the Georgian age or in Victorian times and later as a classroom with soldiers here in the Second World War. So it, I think it's, it's quite a unique experience to, to see it in that way. So visitors, when they come, they'll see the rooms. They'll then go up the, the beautiful main oak staircase to the first floor where we've got exhibition rooms. We've got an activity room for children as well. And obviously we've got the grounds outside. And although significantly smaller than perhaps a National Trust property, they're, they're beautiful. And um, we've got lovely sweeping lawns, kitchen garden. It, it's perfect for if you're coming for a picnic, that sort of thing, a good run around for, for families. But also there's a lot of beautiful trees here, old, beautiful trees. My favourite's the, the old cedar of Lebanon at the main historic gates. Um, so there's plenty to see outside as well. And we've got, although I'm very biased, we've got a fabulous cafe, a fabulous gift shop. So it's a lovely day out and it's free entry. So it's wonderful for, for families with little ones. We've got trails to go around the house and things. So a lot of what we offer is free. We then have additional events through the year. So fairs, outdoor cinema, theatre, concerts, sculpture exhibition, some of which are a cost, but, but it's all very accessible. We, that's sort of our, our main point is that we want to be accessible to all. So there's a lot going on here, a lot to come and see. Absolutely. It sounds like it. And I, I was just thinking as you were talking that one of the most kind of atmospheric properties I've seen was um, a place called Acton Court. I don't know if you visited, but it actually has no furniture inside. And it's interesting that just as you say, it allows you to kind of, I, I don't know, I find it quite atmospheric and you're able to imagine more the scenes at the time. And so I can sort of imagine what you're what you're saying about, about Shaw House. I think that's sometimes a, a benefit, as you say, without all that kind of later furnishing and sparkly things. Yeah, you're not, you're not guided. And actually, if you've got an interest, a lot of people that come here are interested in, in the Tudor history and Elizabethan history. But if you've got a history and more of the Edwardian side, you can imagine it in that era. Instead, you're not sort of guided in a certain historical direction. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but we, we open through February till the end of September. We're open on weekends um, and then during school holidays, we're open as well. So um, always good to check the website in case we've got events on and that sort of thing but yeah we've got a lot of open days and Acton Court actually is somewhere I tried to get to this summer uh -huh. but I missed out on tickets so it's it's on the list it's on the ever-growing uh -huh. list yeah you'll absolutely Very love helpful. it that is um yeah that is incredibly atmospheric as well so I know you do some exhibitions there you already mentioned you have some exhibition rooms tell us a little bit about the Dressed for Shore exhibition this was something that um my colleague Gabriella and I 
created during the first lockdown. We've had quite a few lockdowns here in the UK. Um, but during lockdown one, we were still coming into the house. Obviously, the house was empty. We didn't have meetings going on. But a few staff would be coming into the house to, to keep an eye on it and to, to work behind the scenes. And Gabriella and I were coming in together. And we thought, wouldn't it be great to create an exhibition that was very visual and really brought to life the history of the house? So over time, Dress for Sure was created. It's a costume exhibition that goes through the history of the house. So it's formed sort of a timeline through costume. And it's great because often I, I talk about bringing the rooms to life in the era that you like, but with people who perhaps don't have that interest in history or don't have that the same imagination with regards to history, it's really good to see a very visual aspect of it. So to have those clothing, you kind of remember, oh, yes, this was an Elizabethan house with an Elizabethan family. And oh, soldiers were based here. And this is the uniform they wore. It's, it's a very visual way to bring things to life. And we wanted to just highlight the personal stories of people that either lived or worked and basically energized the house over the last 400 years. So we picked out some of the main characters, if you like, from the history, starting with the Elizabethan couple, the Dolmans that, that built Shaw House, the Georgian gentleman, the Duke of Shandos, um, Queen Anne. We've got the Second World War soldier. We've got the school pupil. Um, so it brings you right up to, to the 21st century history of, of Shaw House. And what's wonderful as well was that the majority of the costumes were handmade for us. So once we decided on our characters, we, we wrote to this fabulous woman, Daphne, who put our scribbles on paper and made them reality. And I think it was lockdown two that we started receiving fun boxes to unwrap. And, you know, you'd open the box and there'd be a, a, um, a royalist hat, you know, fantastic feather on. And, you know, it, it really brightened our lockdown two, I must say, um, getting all these boxes delivered. But yeah, it's been wonderful seeing the exhibition run, um, seeing all the people admiring the costumes. And it was meant for 2021 and it, it ran through our opening. But because it was so popular, we've decided to, to continue it next year. So visitors will see the costumes still next year when they visit. Oh, wonderful. I'm hoping to get over there next year, fingers crossed. So I, I hope to come in and say hello to you. Um, and so obviously, you you know, I can see that you're very passionate about the house. You love it. What are, you know, some of the specific things that you love about working at Shaw House? I think the way that the house has been restored to be a working house to have so many different hats available to it. Um, so it's got the delegate side, it's got the heritage side. We also have the registrar office up on the second floor. So we have visitors daily for that reason. We have a lot of weddings going on. There's just so many different aspects to Shaw that no day really is the same. You're always doing something new. And that I love, the, the variety of that I really, really enjoy and the, the great thing about Shaw in particular is the sense of community because we're owned by the council we have a, a, as I say a lot of council training here so you get to know the community really well and through our events as well as I mentioned we're, we always aim to be accessible and we've got our, our fair Christmas fair you know we always see return visitors to that and it, it's just lovely to, to have that sense of community because obviously our our role in, in part is to care for the house, but it's always as well to, to share the house. So we have a duty of, of care to actually highlight the history and share it with people locally because it's really what we're aiming to do with our different events and open days. But mainly just working in heritage, I love that no day is the same. Through my roles I've had through the years, one minute you're doing a guided tour the next you're catching escapee sheep or finding <laughs> buckets for water leaks, that sort of thing. Um, that you're always on your toes. And, you know, in the office, I've got my pair of runaround shoes. I've got my smart shoes and then I've got my wellies for all occasions. Um, so the variety at Shaw and generally in Heritage is something I really enjoy. Yeah, that sounds like my cup of tea. I'm not good at sitting down, just doing one thing for the whole day. Uh, and just out of curiosity, have any have you had any little ghost sightings or, or strange goings on at the house when you were talking before? A lovely, nice, bright light just flashed by behind you. So I wanted to know. 
Well, I hope they leave me alone today. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, I I personally haven't here, but we do have ghost nights oh, through the year. Oh, that's so exciting. we have groups. Yeah, we have groups that, that come um, for an evening. They stay overnight and they walk around the house and, um, yeah, go hunting for ghosts. So there's there's stories and certainly people have, have said, uh, certainly pupils have come back. Well, and there said, was another really good one. Sarah, sorry to interrupt you. It just went diagonally across the screen. Oh, no, they're trying to tell me I'm this here. A good light Look. show. I'm, like, I'm really enjoying this. I'm obviously completely oblivious to them. <laughs> which is probably good considering I work here but no it's as I say we have those ghost nights and they're they're popular of course and what we do have in the basement is a a tunnel that runs from one wing to the other and a lot of pupils that come back that were at Shawhouse School mentioned that uh, they used to sort of sometimes sneak down there to see if they could spot a ghost and also the second floor was known as the forbidden corridor so again a lot of spooky stories there yeah I love that I'm a big fan of a a good ghost story and you mentioned earlier when we were chatting that there's Donington Castle that's nearby are there any other sort of historic sites that you would recommend if people are in the area for a day or two yeah so Donington Castle is beautiful it's a it's owned by English heritage it's basically all that remains is, is the gatehouse to a once much larger castle but it's a lovely place to go for a nice long walk and it's beautiful views over Newbury as well so it's it's worth visiting um nearby you've also got Highclere Castle um of course the Downton Abbey fans and in terms of Tudor places to visit there's a place called Dorney Court which is mainly used for weddings and events now but I'm pretty sure they do open days as well but as I briefly mentioned earlier Shaw House, the location of the house is really good. Um, you're only about an hour from London, again, about an hour from um, Bath and Bristol Way, again, less than an hour from Southampton, where there's a lot of Tudor, especially the naval history there. So there's lots to see locally, but also we're not far from, yes. from those big locations where there's so much to see. But I think one of the main houses that I visited this summer was Shani's Manor House. I hope oh, I'm yes. saying that right. It's, oh, it was beautiful and it's a beautiful Tudor house it's just off the M25 around London so it was about well just over an hour from here but it it was beautiful a really really enjoyable visit so they've got gorgeous gardens and there's a an ancient oak in the the gardens that's known as Queen Elizabeth's Oak because it's thought she lost some jewellery there and just all the stories there were fantastic yeah I definitely recommend visiting there Yes, I visited many years ago and I actually still remember the stunning gardens. They're they're kind of etched in my memory. That was so beautiful. I think they had a rose garden from memory at the time that was in bloom and it was just stunning. And the house is is quite amazing too. Fabulous. You've given us lots of good ideas there to create a nice itinerary, I think, if we're visiting. (laughs) Now, Sarah, one of the things we do on episodes of Talking Tudors is play what I call a little game of 10 to go. So these are just 10 questions to get to know you a little bit better. So number one, what are you currently reading? Well, um, this is very intellectual and historical. I'm actually reading the Harry Potter books. Oh, lovely. (laughs) Yeah, I've loved Harry Potter since I was young. And I just thought it's it's a nice sort of escape, isn't it, from the real world, um, getting lost in a, a good nostalgic book. So yes, Harry Potter at the moment. <laughs> Absolutely. And what about a favourite holiday or Christmas tradition? Ooh, that's a good one. A holidays, when I was younger, we'd always visit the Isle of Wight. And um, my parents actually live there now. <laughs> so oh. I've got sort of a permanent holiday home there now. But yeah, so we'd always visit the Isle of Wight. And I guess the traditions would be going to some of our favourite places over there. Um, Osborne House is beautiful to visit Carisbrook Castle places like the Donkey Sanctuary loved going there and that sort of thing and I've in terms of Christmas I've always spent Christmas with my family and I'm an only child so just having that time just with my parents it's it's lovely. When you were a child what did you dream of being when you were older? I I remember when I was younger watching well firstly when I was much younger, obviously I wanted to be a singer because the Spice Girls were the greatest thing <laughs> on the planet. Um, but then growing up, I remember watching Night at the Museum, the film, and seeing one of the uh, the characters there giving a guided tour. And I thought, oh, that's a great job, you know, talking to people about something you're really passionate about. So 
I really wanted to do something like that. But growing up, I was so shy that I thought, no, I'll never do that. <laughs> but yeah, just threw myself in at the deep end and became a tour guide as my first job and uh, haven't looked back since. So fantastic. And if you could visit any country in the world uh, right now, where would you go? I've always wanted to go to Egypt, always, always. Since working at High Clear, obviously the links to Tutankhamun because the fifth Earl of Carnarvon discovered Tutankhamun with Howard Carter. Actually, next year it'll be the 100th year anniversary of that. But so at High Clear, there's the Egyptian exhibition. So I learned all the history about it. I actually wrote my dissertation on the items that Carnarvon and Carter found. So I'd love to go to Egypt and visit the Valley of the Kings and Cairo Museum. Yeah, I'd love to do that. That's been on my list for a long time as well. I think since watching all those kind of movies as a, as a child, I've thought, oh, that looks so amazing. So yeah, I agree with you. What about something you love about where you live? I love that it's a town. So you've got all you need. You've got all the shops and, and you're near to train stations, that sort of thing. But you're never too far from feeling like you're in the middle of nowhere with the countryside. I love going for walks on, you know, the fields nearby. I live by the canal. So there's lovely walks up and down the canal through Victoria Park, which is in Newbury. I, I, so I suppose the nature, the natural side of, of where I live is what I love the most. What was the last movie or show that you watched? I know I have actually rewatched um, the Tudors series fairly recently, <laughs> interestingly. <laughs> I think when I was when I was writing the book, it kind of got me in the mood for historical, yeah, <laughs> historical absolutely. writing. <laughs> But yeah, so rewatched the Tudors recently. Yeah, fantastic. Someone else on another um, episode suggested rewatching a scene of Wolf Hall, the BBC production. So now I'm, I, it's in my head, and I need to go and find it so I can watch this particular scene where Cromwell's in his in his house. It sounded so atmospheric. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't seen Wolf Hall. Oh, I keep this on my list. No, uh, I haven't seen well, it. Well, I think I that's, recommended it. Yeah, that's the one you need to go and find and watch now that you've got your cozy weather. You can get all cozy and watch that. It'll be it'll be really atmospheric. And what about a signature recipe? Oh, I wouldn't say I'm particularly gifted in the kitchen. <laughs> so anything that is fairly easy with minimal ingredients is my go-to. I normally... I, I don't know if it's cheating, but I get the, the ready-made pastry and there's so much you can do with that. And I have to make this sort of Mediterranean tart with lots of veg and feta cheese. And I love doing that sort of thing. So that's probably my go-to, but anything that's very easy to make, I will accept. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's cheating at all. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, and do you have a favourite colour? Oh, yes, I think blue. I really like the colour blue. Yeah, it's quite calm. Um, it's just nice and calm. Beautiful. And lucky last, do you have any pets? I don't where I live now, but I grew up with cats and dogs, but also a tortoise my, who my parents still have. And they've made very clear is my inheritance um, <laughs> because they live so long. So she, yeah, she, Torty, she's a unique character. And the last thing, the last question is for a Tudor takeaway. So this is something for our listeners to go off and explore after the show. So do you have a Tudor takeaway for us? For me, I, I think I've mentioned earlier that I'm very much a visual learner. I like to be immersed in history. So Whilst books and documentaries and films are absolutely fabulous for sparking that interest and giving you the, the facts, for me, it's visiting the historical places that really brings it to life. And, and that's how I learn best. So that's probably why I've worked in historic <laughs> places for so long as well. But so for a deeper understanding, particularly of the Tudor period, I really, really recommend going to the Mary Rose Museum in Portsmouth. It's just even if you're not interested in sort of naval history, it's fantastic it gives you a deeper look into the the life at that time so not just you know what happened obviously it was a very tragic disaster but the way it's presented it's so wonderfully and thoughtfully done and all the items oh my gosh you know from the actual time there's a, a tiny little dice from from a game that was that was preserved so there's so much to see and if you're interested in Tudor life in general it's definitely a good place to go and be completely immersed in that history it is those items again it's an, it's like that emotional connection that you can make through those everyday sort of objects which is amazing I haven't seen it since it was 
or renovated. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to visiting again as well. So many places to see. I'm really oh, the, the list is always so long because when I tick somewhere off, I add about three more places. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Fun. I know. Absolutely. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show and for talking Tudors with us. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you at your house next year. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind-the-scenes news. You'll also find me on Twitter. My handle is on the Tudor Trail and on Instagram as the most happy 78. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. <laughs> <laughs>